Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Life is a Story We Tell Ourselves. Today, we have with us Dom Nessie to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, Dom is a certified uh, security expert uh, with experience as the Vice President of Airport Engagement and Aviation Information Sharing and Analytics. Uh, he was the senior airport uh, consultant with Burns Engineering and also spent uh, a number of years, almost 10 years, as deputy director and chief information officer with the Los Angeles World Airports. He was the associate director and chief information officer of the National Park Service, uh, which is where we met. Welcome to the program, Dom. Hi, good morning, Don. So tell us, Dom, how did you become a cybersecurity expert and focus and then end up focusing on airport security? Well, it was back around uh, 1999, 1998. The, I was uh, at the time working for Indian Affairs, and there was a lot of interest in the federal government starting uh, on cybersecurity. For the most part, the federal government was woefully inadequate in that uh, topic. So I just decided to uh, start studying uh, the CISSP for the CISSP exam. And, and the, I'm sorry. The CISSP, what does that mean? A certified Information Systems Security Practitioner uh, offered okay. by the organization ISC Squared. Um, so, I, you know, I started studying for it. I just decided to read the book and um, took the exam and received my CISSP in 2002. I think by that time I was working for the National Park Service. and. Uh, it's been something that's been somewhat of a passion of mine for the past 20 years. Well, when we talk about cyber uh, security, let's, you know, start off maybe uh, giving our listeners a, an understanding of what cyber security is and, and what it actually involves. So when someone, you know, becomes a cyber security expert, what does that mean? And, and what kind of knowledge base do, do they have to have? Well, you have to understand almost everything about information technology. And I can't say that I do understand everything about information technology, but I, I've learned enough to understand you know, how it works, how networks work, how applications and systems work, how they, how they handle our business needs, um, and Cyber, and because those systems have databases with information in them, they have, they're important to our operations, uh, they've become a target for criminals, mm -hmm. stealing the information, disrupting the operations. Uh, in some cases, they're just trying to get proprietary information from an organization. So uh, the, the cyber criminals come in a huge variety. And so really what a cybersecurity specialist does is identify uh, the potential threats to an organization, look at the vulnerabilities that that organization may have, and uh, devise a, a defense to protect against those threats. So what do those threats, you know, look like? And what? And so you have a computer, somebody has a computer at their desk or they have a warehouse full of servers um, where this data and information is stored. What are these cyber criminals doing uh, exactly uh, to compromise uh, that data? I mean, we hear about hackers and, you know, super hackers and black hat ha hackers and green hat hackers and, you know, so what what are these uh, criminals, these cyber criminals doing um, to to threaten uh, your computer sitting on your desk or a uh, warehouse full of servers? What are they attacking? So, Don, here's an interesting thing about cyber crime. It's probably the one um, aspect of a person's life that they, say they face the same peril at home, in their own private office, their children, their wife, as they do in their corporate or organizational or business world. Mm -hmm. Cyber criminals are looking for, well, 
they're, they're either motivated by one of two things, money or politics. Those are really, it comes down to those two things. Um, in the last, I would say four or five years in the corporate realm, or I should say, you know, the business realm, there's really been three types of major attacks. Now, and when I say just three, there's probably 50 or 60 uh, variants and in, in, in different types of attacks. But the three that have stood out in the past three or four years are credential theft, where somebody steals your credentials, pretends they are you, and uh, for a financial gain. Ransomware, uh, same thing. Uh, in this case, they tie up your system, they encrypt it. Encryption is you can't beat the you can't beat their encryption system most likely. And when you and, say encryption system, they come in uh, and somehow compromise your data and prevent you from being able to use it. They encrypt it, and then they you can't use it, and they hold that data hostage. That's correct. That's exactly you, what ransomware is. Mm -hmm. And then the final one, and then I could go into depth on any of those three, mm -hmm. is. Uh, nation state or, or terrorist uh, cyber threats. And we're seeing much more of that uh, in the past two or three years. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting phenomena because in the old days, you had to be a fairly rich country to engage in a kinetic attack, attack on another country. You had to have an air force or an army now all you need is a couple of really smart computer experts sitting in a room and they can launch major attacks uh, or do major espionage on a, another nation. So in cybersecurity, the playing field has really been leveled in terms of warfare. So those are the three, Don, that have really become prominent in the past, let's say four years. Right. Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more depth. Depth uh, later. We're going to talk about the Solar Winds um, uh, attack and and what happened with the government and with other uh, businesses in, in the United States. But before we get to that, um, I think our listeners are sitting at their computers, and many of them use Facebook, for example, um, and they get hacked. Uh, someone um, is able to. Uh, get into their uh, personal in information and you see someone who uses Facebook sending you several messages trying to friend you or doing I guess what they call phishing and a, a lot of our listeners and, and people that attend my other science seminars you know they want to know what it is that these hackers are doing and why Facebook and all these huge corporations can't do anything to prevent you know this quote uh, hacking from from going on. So I'm sitting here at my laptop, you know, right now I see, you know, I know how to use my computer, but there's this stuff going on in the background, these operating systems that are going on, uh, that are actually in the background, making you work with your computer in a seamless manner. But there's the, this complex language that's back there. So how do these hackers gain access to something that you don't even see on your computer or most people don't even know that's there. And Don, you just hit on something that's really important. You know, if someone steals your wallet, you know it immediately. Mm -hmm. If someone uh, hacks you, you might not know it for six months, eight months. In fact, I think the average number of days a business knows before they know that they've been hacked is uh, 14 months, and and it's, sometimes it's up to six months after before they actually reveal it. But in simple terms, hacking is the attempt to somehow gain access to your system, whether it's your desktop or your business, and put an internal program on your computer, on your IT uh, resource, that will have a nefarious objective. And again, that could be ransomware, they could be stealing data. The, the goal 
is to just get access to your computer. So the question is, how do they do that? Unfortunately, about 80% of hacking is based on social engineering, which is defined as the person, the owner, the business owner, someone sitting at their computer, making a mistake that really they should have known better not to do, and clicking on a link, opening an email that they shouldn't have opened. Mm-hmm. And that will put a little program in the background onto your computer. You don't even know that it happened. That little program then provides the attacker with a door into everything that you do on your system. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the door. Uh, Again, it could come in through a phishing email. It could come in through you clicking on a on a link to a fake site. Uh, You could be providing information, uh, you know, on a website that you think is going to your bank and it's not. Hmm. Uh, There's a variety of, they have a variety of ways of of getting to you. And many times you don't even know that you've done it. That's what I understand. And, and people, They've gotten a little bit more educated about not clicking on these things. I guess they call it clickbait, where uh, especially on Facebook or social media sites, they'll have things to get people to click, um, you know, by piquing your curiosity on a p- particular subject that you might be interested in. You click on it, and then um, that's the way uh, a hacker can, can gain uh, access. And, of course, there are lots of sophisticated ways that uh, that, that can uh, can can happen. So let me give you an example of how Facebook can really hurt a person. As you know, that there are a lot of uh, systems when you forget your password, mm-hmm. it says uh, they're going to ask you a series of challenge questions. Right. So if I want to target Don Murphy, and I might start with going to your Facebook and finding out, you know, where you live what your hobbies are, what your favorite music is, and all those things that people uh, innocently put out on Facebook. Then I take a guess at your username, go to a website, and then it, and I say, I forgot my password. And if they had uh, some other information on you, such as your email address, they can uh, log on to your email get the challenge questions, or sometimes the challenge questions just come up on the screen. And they answer the questions because you gave them the answer through Facebook. Right. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that. And, and, and a lot of people are, are a lot more savvy uh, nowadays. And I guess social media sites now have what they call um, double protection um, so, that, um, so that that kind of thing doesn't happen. But I understand hackers have a way around even that uh, so-called uh, double authentication or something like that, I guess is what they call it. Don, in the cybersecurity world, we always say, if you build a 12 foot wall, the bad guys will bring a 13 foot ladder. There's right. always a way to get in. Right. Uh, that's that's amazing. And, and, you know, somewhat scary, especially the, the part about the uh, war, cyber warfare that goes on between uh, countries. Again, we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, later here. Uh, but the world will never be the same because of COVID, the COVID virus outbreak. But at the same time, you know, there's been this outbreak that we've just been talking about, about computer viruses uh, spread by hackers. And you've just you know, given us some insight about how these hackers uh, gain access to systems that are supposed to be uh, um, secure and have the best security um, in the world. But that leads me to, to ask the, the question, that, I mean, is there a comparable uh, thing to a biological vaccine uh, in, the, in the cyber world where you have, you can vaccinate computers? Um, I guess you hear of all these commercial companies that have uh, these uh, antivirus uh, programs that are supposed to protect your commuti- computer. So do they really, and, and is that effective? You know, uh, the term 
a virus is just it's one of many types of malware that are out there. You have viruses and worms and Trojan horses. Viruses in particular receive that name because they require a host to transfer from one uh, machine to another. That's why they're called a virus. They, they can't spread themselves on their own like a worm does. Um, when you, if you want to use an analogy, uh, for the most part, what we do in the cybersecurity world is we wear masks and we social distance and we do all of those kind of things. And that's the kind of defenses that we have. Um, antivirus programs, what they do is they, any input coming into your system, it will uh, read that and reject it if they see a signature that looks like a, a, a signature of a threat. So there's not really a medical um, analogy to an antivirus system. Really what you're trying to do is keep all the doors and windows shut on your system and only allow people or entities or other organizations or other systems into your IT environment that are trustworthy. Understand. So despite all of that and what you've already talked about with in terms of how to you can protect against threats, uh, these cyber warfares uh, continue. And of course, in December, there was a major attack on U.S. businesses and uh, the government. So could, maybe you could explain to our listeners what took place in the most recent hacking of government and other computers in the United States through the uh, through, through the solar winds uh, software. Sure. It, it, if I can digress just for a second. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I mentioned social engineering that sometimes people uh, invite the bad guys into their system just unwittingly. Other times, cyber criminals will find a vulnerability in a program and they're able to uh, use that to get into your system without knowing it. In your communication, uh, you have a, you know, a communication system that basically has what is called ports, mm -hmm. which are open doors coming into your network. And they will scan looking for open ports to connect to. Um, when I was at LAX, we would get about 500,000 hits a day from people scanning our servers looking for open, unprotected ports. So uh, particularly the vulnerabilities of software, um, you know, af after the social engineering issue is a major concern. What happened with SolarWind? SolarWind is a company that has a software product called Orion. And Orion is used by large, large corporations to manage their IT infrastructure. So when I was at uh, LAX, we had you know, about 4,000 desktop computers, uh, 900 to 1,000 laptops. We had you know, a couple hundred servers. So you have to manage all of that. Each of those are considered a node. They're all somehow connected. Orion is a software that helps you manage all of that. Uh, another thing about computing that's really important to understand is that if you were protected yesterday at 100%, you're probably not today because computer systems continually change. People make changes, people do things they shouldn't. And your defensive posture is always in a state of degradation. So when you're saying you're always making changes, like for example, um, with this latest attack uh, that happened in December, we understand it, it, was, it, it happened as a result of uh, systems updating themselves or uh, the use of software to do updates. And, and so when you're saying that um, you were protected at 100% yesterday, but tomorrow you won't be. It's because perhaps you, you did an update um, or uh, you 
your computer system grew and you had to change the platform. Is th- are those the kind of things you're talking about? Those kind of things, plus your users. Sometimes if you haven't locked down your system well enough, your users will bring a new program in. You know, they'll, mm. they'll go out and buy software and they'll load it on their local desktop. Mm. And that may open a port for that particular company who owns that software to, you know, to do diagnostics. Um, you know, the, one of the biggest threats in the corporate environment are people bringing in USBs mm-hmm. that have a virus on them. They plug them in and they introduce a, a virus into the system. Again, it's somewhat social engineering, but I, I'll give you a great example of that. About seven years ago, North Korea just really wanted to disrupt South Korea. So they developed a really addictive um, game, some kind of multimedia game. Mm -hmm. And they had their agents pass it out in Seoul and other major cities, thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of this game. Everybody who played it was in effect loading on to their local computers, their desktops, something called a bot. And with that bot, uh, all of a sudden, North Korea had thousands of South Korean computers working for them, and they started attacking South Korea businesses and the airports. I mean, they just literally shut them down. So I've digressed a little bit from the, the solar winds, and let me get back to that. So because these systems are continually degrading, you have a regular regimen of patching. Sometimes the patch is to um, make the software better, new functions, new features. Sometimes it's to fix a vulnerability that was found. Mm -hmm. So whoever did this was fairly ingenious because when you go to download a patch and upgrade your system, particularly from a company like SolarWinds, who is, you would just expect to be extremely cyber secure, you downloaded onto your system uh, malware. And SolarWinds had 33,000 customers and their numbers were about approximately 18,000 downloaded the patch to the Orion software. Now we heard about the major federal agencies and I know some airports also uh, had, were, were customers of Solar Wind, but they didn't make the news. But there were about 18,000 U.S. businesses that, in effect, had uh, opened back doors to whoever these cyber criminals were or are. That is absolutely in, incredible. How do you think? Do you speculate? I mean, you're a cybersecurity expert. How do you how do you think that happened? Well, they found a vulnerability somewhere on their server, on, on SolarWinds server. And it had to have been a fairly sophisticated effort. I don't think SolarWinds yet knows how somebody got in. It could have been as simple as a, a person answering an email and clicking on something that they shouldn't have. It could have been. Uh, something far more um, uh, you know, sophisticated. I, I, I haven't read that they've learned how it got in there. But once it was on, it's, not, it's something you don't see. Uh, and so, so they had that program going, that, those downloads going for months before they realized that there was an issue, solar wind. You mentioned airports, um, and and of course that's what you've been in, involved in the most in in recent years in airport security, and I think that's what you know people are, are very concerned about. I mean, if an airport is hacked, l- let me just ask you a simple question. I mean, can can that translate into the uh, computer system of an actual airplane being uh, hacked and 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 uh, hijacked? Uh, through a, a cyber uh, 
security lapse? Is that something that's possible? Well, Boeing and Airbus say it's not. Um, you know, I worked at an airport, but I was very involved in a larger topic called aviation cybersecurity. When I was with the aviation ISAC that you mentioned in my introduction, we provided cybersecurity intelligence to airports, airlines, uh, airframe manufacturers, and uh, third party services that support um, the aviation industry. Let me start with the answer your question directly. Um, Airbus and, and Boeing, the two largest manufacturers, and then there's Embraer, which is another large one, they have thoroughly tested their system. They believe that there is no way that their systems can be hacked. Every once in a while, you'll read that somebody has been able to hack a system, and most of the time, in fact, all the time, it has been disproven. Uh, you know, I mean, you can be on an airplane and you could be doing Wi-Fi. Well, Airbus and Boeing claim that their entertainment systems and their internal Wi-Fi systems have no connection whatsoever from the avionics system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, frankly, I would, I would believe that. I, that would be an incredible compromise to have them, both of those, running on the same infrastructure. Despite that, you'll get people who will say that they've been able to jump from the uh, entertainment system into the avionics. And, but nobody has proven that they actually could do it. It's, I think most of the time it's people seeking uh, publicity. So it sounds like in order to compromise an actual airplane, an airliner, um, someone physically uh, would have to uh, compromise the, the, the avionics. I mean, some spy um, <laughs> would have to uh, gain access somehow and uh, put in malware uh, that couldn't be detected. Um, and that, that's something you say that's, that's very difficult to do. That's correct. The, the, the communication between the ground and an aircraft is encrypted. But that's very difficult to to break. Um, air, airport, I'm sorry, airline pilots, they have uh, the ability that if they sudden, if, if all of a sudden they got a message that said, you know, drop 20,000 feet in the next five minutes, they have fail safe uh, systems in place to, to, to verify that type of information. Uh, I don't feel any uncomfort whatsoever with right. airlines flying, airplanes flying. Um, well, I think our, our listeners will, will be happy to, uh, to, to hear that. Um, but yet, uh, we know that for the last quarter century, uh, there's been a cyber war going on. I mean, people talk about the Cold War being over. Uh, but as soon as the Cold War was over, or even before it was over, um, cyber wars uh, took um, started taking over, and so as a result of the solar winds, you know, activity, one of the things that that we've learned in, in terms of spycraft and uh, cyber wars uh, was brought out in in an LA Times article, and and one of the uh, experts uh, in this area was quoted as saying, "But unless the government was aware." and I'm quoting now, of the vulnerability in solar winds and kept it secret, and this is the key part, which it sometimes does to de develop offensive cyber weapons, that is cyber weapons against other countries, there would have been little reason not to install the most up-to-date version um, of the software. Now the Times report goes on to say there's no evidence that the government Officials were withholding any knowledge of the flaw uh, in the solar winds uh, software, but it is troubling um, because this implies that uh, countries, other countries, our our enemies, 
uh, can use our own cyber attacks uh, against us. So if we have a uh, cyber weapon that we're using to compromise their systems, they can learn from that and then turn around um, and uh, use that to gain access to our systems. What do we do about that? Well, first of all, it is absolutely true. Um, NSA, National Security Agency, and the CIA have uncovered vulnerabilities in software for which they have not sought uh, or alerted the manufacturer of that vulnerability because they wanted to be able to use that to their own uh, benefit if they ever needed it. Ironically, somebody hacked NSA about four or five years ago uh, and then used those tools that NSA had been saving to attack other U.S. agencies. Right. So, you know, they have that old saying, Don, um, what goes around comes around. Right. Uh, that has happened on more than one occasion in the cybersecurity world. Um, if I could uh, just do a little story here on, on, on uh, cybersecurity in nation state. You know, really the first major example of this was a, a malware called Stuxnet. And back in the days when the Iranian government was uh, supposedly, you know, the Americans thought they were building, a, you know, a nuclear weapon and Israel, I'm sorry, Iran said it was just for power plants. Um, there was always that talk of, you know, should should someone bomb them? Israel was always talking about bombing them. And then all of a sudden, they got hit by a cyber attack, the Iranian centrifuges. One day, the centrifuges just started spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning until they destroyed themselves. And it was determined that there was a virus called Stuxnet that had been introduced into that equipment. Um, no one has ever claimed responsibility. Everybody assumes it was either Israel and or the United States. And was interesting how the spy craft began with that. Uh, President uh, Adinejad from Iran wanted to did a video boasting about his, uh, his uh, nuclear program. So on the video, he's walking through the centrifuges. Somebody picked up the, the information they could see right behind him that they were running a particular Siemens. I know you're familiar with the German company Siemens sure. uh, centrifuge. They looked in the Siemens documentation to find out what was the, uh, the PCL, the programming control logic for that uh, particular centrifuge. And they devised this incredible software. Now, they think that it was uh, just introduced on a single USB drive into the Iranian environment. And basically, it destroyed the nu their nuclear program for 18 months or so. Uh, and since then, it's been literally open warfare. I shouldn't say open warfare. Uh, it has been constant warfare between large governments and you just never really know who it's coming from. But it, it's grown in, in, in major proportions in the past four or five years. And take, go back to solar wind. If any of our nuclear or power grid plants, power, power companies were using solar wind, there's a good chance that some adversary has a back door into our power grid right now. In fact, and I think I read a report four or five years ago that it is just assumed that the Chinese could shut down the entire power grid of the United States if they wanted to. Right. So in other words, you could see a scenario, and um, I know I'm making up a, a, a hypothetical or a scenario, but you could see a situation where if tensions really grew over Taiwan 
and Hong Kong between the United States and, and China. Um, there are other weapons now that these nations have, including the United States, uh, to cripple a nation uh, other than using uh, conventional uh, warfare. And I guess this is what people are, are extremely uh, concerned about. I mean, have we really transcended uh, the use of you know, conventional warfare with this uh, cyber warfare that, that we can, can wage and uh, cripple uh, entire nations, not just their you know, electrical systems, but their, their drinking water, uh, compromise uh, communications, uh, there are all sorts of things that can uh, uh, that can happen during this this kind of warfare. Well, the, the answer to that is absolutely. There's no question that um, you know the major attackers now: Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, are all engaging in cybersecurity attacks on the United States, NATO. Our NATO allies. There's a there's a couple of different uh, programs that have um, a graphical interface. Uh, they 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 belong to certain companies. You can actually look at the world and see where attacks are being taken right now, where they're coming from, and where they're going to. If they have that particular company's um, software in place and what kind of attack it is. And it looks like a video game. You literally see hundreds of lines coming out of Russia and out of China into the United States. And then we'll list the type of, of what they've blocked and vice versa. You see them coming out of the United States and you see them coming from half the countries in the world, Australia, Europe, um, many times you don't see much in Africa, but uh, it's an it, it's an interesting. Uh, it's called the Norse attack map is the one that I look at N O R S E, and uh, I haven't looked at it recently, but it's been online uh, for a number of years. And you just look at it, you can watch attacks taking place or attempted attacks. It's just absolutely amazing. You mentioned something called the back door. I did a seminar a couple of years ago um, about it, it was a result of the conflict between uh, go the government um, in the United States uh, and these uh, large social media uh, companies where the United States uh, wanted uh, to have a back door uh, into uh, these various uh, social media platforms so that if there were attacks or if there were information that they wanted, um, for example, if they were looking for a particular um, person who committed a crime or if they were looking for certain evidence, they wanted to have a way of accessing that uh, through what's called uh, a back door. And uh, in the seminar, we talked about the sophisticated algorithms uh, that uh, are used in um, in these uh, back doors, and it's 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 absolutely fascinating because we got down into the algebra, the mathematics of actually how they, you know, make these algorithms and they code so that you can't um, get in through a back door. But the government was saying we wanted that those algorithms, we wanted that that information. So how vulnerable are governments, uh, businesses? and uh, social media platforms um, through the concept of getting in through the back door, having these sophisticated mathematical algorithms that they can use um, uh, to get into uh, computers and, and get uh, information. Well, let me, let me differentiate between two things. Uh, when you speak of an algorithm, a complicated algorithm, that usually refers to encryption. Yes. And when uh, data is encrypted, uh, unless you have the key to that uh, particular encryption algorithm, you're almost not going to be able to ever read that information. Correct. So that's where algorithms uh, re uh, really come into play. Mm -hmm. And the government has fought against, the U.S. government has fought against uh, encryption systems that are virtually unbreakable. 
Um, they have they have fought hard to try to have encryption systems that they could actually get into. Uh, for the most part, industry has not agreed with that. And that's why the government looks for other types of backdoors, such as um, a vulnerability in the application software, right. a, uh, a vulnerability in the, app, in the hardware of that particular system, because that's how they get in. And, and a backdoor could be just as simple as a network device that has an open port that somebody forgets to close. Um, and there's always, it's always been said that a lot of um, uh, software manufacturers will build in a secret backdoor into their own products so that Correct. if they have to get in, uh, they can. You may remember uh, just a few years ago after the Boston bombing that they were trying to read uh, the cell phone of the bombers and it went on for quite a long time. The government um, imploring Apple to uh, give them the proprietary information that would help them crack into their those iPhones. They went to court and I, as I recall, they weren't, they weren't successful, but apparently some, about a year later, the government said they were able to crack the Apple, um, uh, the Apple security. And I haven't really heard much about it since. But um, yeah, the, the concept of encryption and backdoors is you know, highly mathematical on one and mm -hmm. highly complex and strategic on, on the other. Right. Well, this has, you know, been absolutely fascinating. And I know, you know, probably the final thing our, our listeners want to know is, is, is there any way they can really protect themselves, protect their, their own computer? What, what would you advise as a cybersecurity expert to the common everyday person sitting in front of their lap, laptop? How, how can they best protect themselves? Well, surprisingly, um, the, the, the simplest thing are passwords. And I know passwords are a pain for people. Um, and you'll find people using the same password for every one of their systems. Um, but you need to have a different password for every system you log into. Now, I probably have uh, 200 systems that I'm somehow use. And I have a password for each one of them. And they're unique. That's because I came up with my own little system of creating a password that uses uppercase, lowercase numbers, special characters. And I have my own little, my own little personal algorithm on using the name of that application to create my password. Hmm. So you can't use a brute force attack. Um, because my passwords tend to be long, but I could be anywhere and immediately remember the password for Zoom or um, Dropbox or any of the many systems that I use simply because I have that personal little algorithm. Uh -huh. And I, um, you have to start with passwords. And it's not that you may give up your password. But somebody breaks into um, Orbit or United Airlines. And by the way, Don, I could have talked to you for another hour on aviation cybersecurity. But, sure. you know, you put a lot of personal information on an airline website. Uh, your credit card, where you live, and all those things. And you do that in so many areas. You know, Etsy, Overstock.com, all of those. And if you use the same website and overstock.com gets hacked then they have your they have your password for maybe every system that you use so that's where you start uh, the second is to have on your personal computer an antivirus software that is updated regularly so that any kind of incoming somebody any outside external attempt to access your computer 
will first be read by the antivirus software to see if it has an attack signature in it. And you know, we're all familiar with Norton and McAfee, and there, there's others. Um, so those are the two things. And then of course, the whole social engineering aspect. Don't click on anything that looks suspicious. Um, I can guarantee all your listeners that there is no Nigerian prince who wants to give them fifteen million dollars. <laughs> um, uh, emails from your friends who are somehow stuck in Europe and have no money, and they just need you to wire them some money, um, are probably false. And uh, you. Don't let yourself be social engineered into a situation where you're giving away uh, information that is important. And finally, protect yourself on social media. Don't make I, your identification uh, so clear. Uh, you know, you put your birth date out there, you put where you grew up. You're giving a hacker a lot of information. And here's another thing to remember, and I'm sorry to go on so long. Oh, but please. Sometimes they're attacking Don Murphy personally, and sometimes they're just attacking everybody. And you happen to be swept up in a group, you know, in a group that's being attacked. So if they really want to get you, Don, they'll, you know, they'll do a lot of research on Don Murphy because they realize that, you know, you are a multimillionaire and, you know, they want your money. Or that you have a secret that you want to keep a uh, secret. Oh, by the way, I'm not a multimillionaire. <laughs> You're still so not safe. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, recently I received an email that had an old, old, old password. And the person wanted uh, a ransom of Bitcoin, $5,000. Or they were going to notify everybody in my mailing list. Uh, that I had stolen this, that I was a pedophile, that I was watching porn, that, I, you know, all those, you know, and they, and every time, every deadline that I missed, they were going to send out another email to all my contacts. Hmm. And, you know, I, I knew it was probably fictitious. I could tell by the, I could tell by the email that it wasn't, um, that they weren't going to be able to carry anything out. And I just ignored it. But I've known people who've paid that mm -hmm. money. I've known really smart, intelligent people who've wired money to friends or to people who they thought were their friends who claim to be, you know, um, stranded in Europe. Uh, sometimes these things are really well put together. Well, it's the buyer beware. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Don, that deep breath you took, <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is a very typical response mm -hmm. when you really hear the peril out there uh, for an individual in this new world. Understand. Well, Don, we're going to have you back, um, and we are going to talk a little bit more about uh, aviation uh, security. And I'd also like to talk about the mathematics and the science uh, behind uh, this a little bit, uh, which I know some of my uh, listeners are interested in. Um, but uh, we're at the end of the program. Uh, thank you, Dom. Um, and I, it's just been a pleasure talking to you. We haven't talked for, for a long time. And um, it was also a, a pleasure uh, working with you for all those years at the National Park, Park Service. Um, so thank you. And uh, uh, we'll have you back again soon. Well, the feeling is mutual on both counts, and I'm always available to discuss cybersecurity um, or technology in general with you. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you want to know how to create your own password that you will never forget, you can go to our website at lifeisastorypodcast.com and click on Passwords. Please join us next week when our guest will be Kay Sanger, the founder of the Easter Island Foundation. We will talk about the island's history, its people, and attempts to repatriate statues taken from the island. To stay updated on the latest podcasts, 
please subscribe to the podcast at lifeisastorypodcast.com. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe, share happiness, and remember, never stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing.